The interview will be video audio recorded and will form part of the Inigas family and the Veteranos Sacramentos Mexican American Servicemen Oral History Project that will be housed at the Center for Sacramento History. Do you agree to this recording? Yes. Today is October 16, 2023. It is 2.01 p.m. and we are at the Center for Sacramento History. Please state your full name and spell it, including accents. I'm happy to give you my full name. It's Juan Cesar Iniguez Morales. Okay. And uh, I'm, proud, I'm happy to give it to you because I'm happy to represent the Iniguez side of my family and the Morales side of the family. Um, I have a tilde on the N for Iniguez um, and a, for Cesar an accent on the E. Okay. Do you want to spell it? Uh, which one? All of it. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, Juan. Inigas, uh, Juan, J U A N, Cesar, C E S A R, Inigas, Y N I G U E Z, Morales, M O R A L E S. Great. Thank you. Uh, and where were you born? I was born in Sacramento. And what is your marital status? I am married. Do you have children? And if so, how many and their names? I've got two children. Uh, my older daughter is Veronica, and my younger daughter is Serena. And my wife's name is Victoria. Great, thank you. So where were you raised? I was raised uh, up until the college years uh, in Sacramento, until I was about uh, 13, 14, actually 14, and then we moved out to Carmichael uh, for my high school. Okay, and what did your parents do for a living? My dad was a high school teacher. Uh, and my mother started her career as a legal secretary, bilingual legal secretary, and then later in her career, for the last 20, 25 years, she uh, she uh, started an interpreting translation business. Okay. How many brothers and sisters do you have? There are four of us: uh, an older brother, a Vietnam or a Vietnam era vet. Um, my younger sister, uh, and then a, a younger brother. What was your primary language growing up at home? Good question. Um, because my mother was a native Spanish speaker and my dad was a, a Spanish teacher, um, they really wanted to stress Spanish in the home. So when I was a toddler, an infant, it was puro español. But when my older brother went to school, he couldn't speak English. So my parents had to reverse course. And then from then on, it was predominantly English, at least when we were younger. Uh, but uh, especially with the Morales side of the family, uh, a lot of puros uh, español, so uh, uh, a smattering of English and Spanish throughout my uh, teenage years and, and later on. So it was um, commonplace during that time to dissuade the use of Spanish. Um, and so do you know if the teachers had sort of intervened? And uh, Yeah, um, I suspect that the teachers intervened intervening with my older brother, but I was maybe three when he started kindergarten, so I don't know what discussions might or might not have gone on. Um, and because, uh, in terms of living, uh, the two places that we grew up, my parents were, in terms of color, they were pioneers, and so when they uh, bought their home in Tahoe Park, there were not a lot of Mexicans, so uh, they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, Spanish speakers to talk with, other than uh, my Aunt Jimmy, uh, my cousin Richard's uh, uh, mother, who lived uh, in uh, over by Peter Lassen, which was kind of adjacent to Top Park. So um, there was no Spanish that needed to be dissuaded. Uh, it was just the, the perennial battle of uh, my teachers saying, your name is John, and I have to say to them, no, my name is Juan. And I had uh, one teacher, my first grade teacher, the whole year, she just never gave up John, and I'd say, no, my name is Juan, because my parents trained us, you know, you're not John, you're Juan, so, uh, but no language issues per se. Mm -hmm. uh, please describe your experiences as a child and youth in your family and your neighborhood. Well, uh, I loved growing up in Tahoe Park. Um, uh, I come, I'm so proud to say it. My parents were the best parents in the world, um, loving, caring, 
they focused uh, on us educating ourselves both formally and informally. Uh, they were both very proud of, of, of their Mexicanness. Um, they told us and trained us how not to hide it. Um, and even though at that time, when we were younger, Tahoe Park was not very diverse, it was a very working class environment. So a lot of my friends uh, were the sons of plumbers, uh, construction workers, um, and uh, uh, women were nurses uh, and stay-at-home moms. So it was a very, very middle-class, working-class environment. Uh, and of all things, uh, my dad having uh, gotten his degrees, um, he was one of the few who was college-educated in, in that neighborhood. So it was a very grounded existence. Uh, and for most of, the, of, of our early lives, it was a very safe area. It got kind of rough towards the end, but um, it was just a wonderful uh, upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, did you experience any discrimination? I know you said your neighborhood uh, in Tahoe Park was uh, very diverse, but did you experience any discrimination growing up? You know, it's interesting. Um, my entire life uh, has been f relatively free of open discrimination. Um, in Tahoe Park, um, I didn't feel anything. Uh, I do know that when my parents bought their first home, um, uh, the realtor or somebody told them they couldn't buy in Tahoe Park because the covenants had stipulations not to uh, allow uh, people of color. I think they specifically said Mexican, uh, Negro, the term in those days. They probably said Oriental. Um, but my parents uh, were, I think, uh, savvy enough uh, to not fall for that. So they just threatened to sue if they couldn't buy the house. And, and the realtor backed down and they bought the house. And um, I think part of it uh, was not that there wasn't racism around. Uh, but especially my mother, she had a way of just walking through doors, just not as if they were non-existent. So she conducted herself uh, not with any sense of uh, less than, um, yeah, very proud, uh, very uh, uh, vocal when she needed to be. And so that was the right way we were raised. So we weren't apologizing for being Mexican. Uh, my dad was a, a lot shyer, but very proud in his own way. Um, so we just never grew up with kind of that uh, inferiority complex I think that sometimes it's thrown on us. And then when you're on the playground, at least if you're a boy, nobody cares what color you are. They just want to know if you can make that basket, you know, or, or hit that ball. So mm -hmm. I have to say, you know, other than playground taunts, which we all did, um, I, I can't say that I experienced a lot of uh, childhood prejudice, uh, mm -hmm. though I know it was there. Yes, yes. Um, so, tell tell me a little bit more about your father. What was his name and uh, your mother's name? Yeah. Uh, my mother's name was Olivia Morales Ayala. My father's name, his formal name, uh, interestingly enough, was Tony Joseph Iniguez. It wasn't Antonio, it was Tony Joseph. And uh, I wish I would have asked him why it wasn't Antonio, but I think my grandparents, as, as recent immigrants, trying to just blend into the country, uh, kind of thought, well, let's call our kids, at least some of them, English names rather than Spanish names, so it'll be less trouble for them. Uh, uh, so he's Tony Joseph, and you guess. Um, their upbringings were totally different. Uh, my mother, for lack of a better way of putting it, was uh, raised in a, a really affluent and almost aristocratic family in, in Mexico City. Um, a lot of education in the family. My dad uh, is the son of a, a railroad road worker. Um, my uh, grandpa, Gregorio, was uh, uh, born, in, and, and my uh, grandmother, uh, Beatriz, uh, lived in Tepichilan, uh, Zacatecas. Um, they came as a result of the Cristero Wars. Uh, the violence was just uh, too much. Um, my grandparents were uh, very, very devout Catholics, so I assume uh, they wanted to get away from the federales and the government. 
Um, one of the family stories was that uh, the Federales one time drove up to my parents, my grandparents, uh, I guess, a hut. Uh, you wouldn't call it a home in the sense that we think of today. And uh, they came brandishing their guns on horses. And my grandfather, I think, was out working in the fields. And uh, my grandmother brought out her gun. She stood in front of the door and said, you're not coming in. And they backed down. So uh, that's the kind of uh, environment they left. And then the other story that sticks out in my mind is uh, you would walk down, and my dad remembers this, you would walk down some of the, the dirt roads and you would see the heads of, of uh, people that the Federales had killed. So both historically, we know that it was a brutal, brutal three years, the 26th to 29th, before and after those years too, but particularly during the war itself. Um, and then by accounts that they've passed on, uh, it was pretty rough. So I'm sure my grandparents were happy to leave uh, and come to a safer place. Mm -hmm. Do you know when they arrived and where they arrived to? Or? Uh, I, I don't know exact years, but I know it was uh, probably 26, 29, 1926, 1929. Um, actually, let me correct myself. Uh, my dad was born in 1920, and uh, what they did sometime, I guess it was right after the revolution, before the Cristoro War, my grandparents would come back and forth. They couldn't make it here, <laughs> they couldn't make it there. So my dad spent, even though he was born here in, in Benicia, um, California, um, he had some of his younger years uh, as a, a five or six year old uh, growing up in, in, in Tepichilan. And uh, they were herders. Uh, and so um, one of the stories that he told us was that, you know, he would be asked to carry his weight uh, on the rancho. And um, he, uh, you had to have a herder out, I guess, at night. And so when he was six or seven years old, it was his uh, duty to watch, um, I think it was cows or sheep. Um, and they would put him in a little hut and he'd be scared out of his wits, dark, cold. But that was what he had to do to kind of help out, watch him. This is your father. My father, your yeah. Father. Yeah. So he remembers that, but most of his upbringing was up here in Dunsmuir. Um, I can't tell you exactly how they uh, progressed uh, town to town or uh, uh, city to city, but um, I do know that, that uh, there was a, a, a good amount of working in the fields um, so uh, I can't tell you exactly where they did that when they first came. And then my, my grandfather, uh, Gregorio, uh, caught, up, caught on with the railroad. And uh, he moved the family from Benicia to Dunsmuir. And his job as a railroad person was what they called the section gang, the, the pick, you know. So um, he was a laborer. Very hard work. Very hard work. Very hard um, maybe for the Southern Pacific, do you know? You know, I actually asked a cousin of mine that. We, we pretty much agree it was the Southern Pacific, yeah. Okay. Uh, because... So this predates the Bracero program. Yeah, uh, and then, interestingly enough, uh, sometimes I could be a little bit too flip. One time I was kind of uh, joking with my dad, oh, come, come on, you didn't come over legally, did you, right? I was just trying to joke around with him. But he, he stopped me in my tracks. He said, Mijo, my parents came over legally. So, and, and then somewhere in, in our files, and I'll go find them for you, uh, I have a record of them crossing. Uh, I think it was Juarez. It might have been El Paso. Um, yeah, Juarez and El Paso, same thing. Um, but um, uh, he was very adamant that they didn't cross over what, without the papers. So, uh, mm -hmm. not that, in a certain sense, not that it matters, but that was important to him. Yeah. So. Um, so, uh, your parents met where? Where did they meet? My dad was uh, studying, well, uh, I need to backtrack a little bit. Somewhere in Dunsmuir, my dad got it in his head that he wanted to be a teacher. And it was from a family that had no higher education experience whatsoever. And uh, he just got it in his head he wanted to be a teacher. So, uh, his first step he moved down the hill from Benicia, or from Dunsmuir to Sacramento. He stayed with my Aunt Carmela, who was already here, and he washed dishes 
and then he enrolled in the Sacramento City College. And in, in, in asking him, I, I said, well, how many Chicanos were there in Sacramento City? And he had the answer. He goes, well, there were three of us. <laughs> um, what year was that? Do you, remember, um, do you know? Or? I think it was um, around 46, 47 when he started, I think. It was after the war. might have been 45. Um, and uh, in answer to your question, uh, he did his two years at Sac City, and then he fell in love with Spanish literature. So uh, he decided he would go down to Mexico City to study at the Colegio de Mexico. Mm. And uh, he and my uncle Sal went together and they both en enrolled. And uh, he met my mom at a party. And it was very interesting because here's this dirt poor Mexican-American with this pretty affluent Mexicana. But he saw her and he couldn't let her go. And um, she was only 18 when they married. Um, and uh, he asked my grandfather, my grandfather Juan Morales, for her hand. And my grandfather said, no, I don't have the money. And so he kept asking. And finally, uh, my grandfather said yes. And he was sitting behind his desk. And he pulled out a wad of money. <laughs> he said, I always had the money. I just wanted to make sure you were worthy of my daughter. Mm. So, so they had a beautiful wedding in Mexico City. Uh, and the way that the kind of final touch on, on the relationship was my dad had this idea, well, I want to be engaged to you, then I want to go back and finish my degrees, I want to get a job, and then I'll go, go and get you. And my mom said, no way. You either marry me now or we don't go forward. Mm -hmm. So they married, um, and uh, she came here when she was 18. Mm -hmm. And... Um so your dad served in World War II, correct? He did. Okay, so why don't you tell me a little bit about what you know? Yeah, um, actually, let me backtrack a little bit, because uh, I, I do want to talk about uh, much of my family's service in, in, in the military, but I, I, I just want to clarify for the record. Uh, I've never been a part of the military. I'm a part of the, the Vietnam era generation. Um, I was adamantly against the war. Um, I, it was a quandary in those days uh, when the draft came, what were you going to do? Everybody, at least every male, had to go through this process of soul searching. I was so opposed to the war and I had demonstrated against it and things like that. So um, I just decided I wasn't going to lift a finger to be a part of what I called the, the military machine back then. Uh, but I wasn't going to run either. So I purposely chose not to sign up for the draft. And I figured if they want me, they're going to come and get me. And I was hoping in, in kind of a romanticized way that if they came for me, I would say, okay, I'll go help be a medic or help support the men and women, but I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to carry a gun. And I don't know what possessed me, but I didn't sign up. And then I just put it out of my mind. Um, and I figured, well, somebody's going to come knocking on my door one of these days, but they never did. Uh, and then the year my number came up, uh, it was like, uh, I think it was like 152, and in that year they only took up to 125. So I never got called, I never got noticed, I never got thrown in the clink. <laughs> um, Did you know about the the consequences of not... I didn't even, I didn't even care. It Did, was, it was, but was it well known at the time that well, you they, could potentially be locked up? Yeah, or? well, yeah, that was, they, they scared the holy heck out of it. Yeah, yeah, it was like, you know... Uh, big government over your head, you know. But I didn't really care about the consequences because I um, I just, I, I felt so strongly that it was wrong and I just wasn't going to lift a finger for it. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, declare that. But the reason why I want to be a part of this project is because I, I want to honor my family, those that did go. Um, and and uh, we had, I can explain more detail, but we had uh, relatives, uncles, tios, and, and, and even tias in, in, in the auxiliary uh, uh, organizations serve and wear the uniform um, and uh, uh, fight in, 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 in battle in, in World War II and Vietnam. And uh, our family is such that we're not a, we're, we're not a peleoneros. We, we get along pretty well. We respect each other. So 
there was cousins of mine during Vietnam coming and going all the time. And I loved them. I respected them. Uh, I didn't hold it against them that they went. I don't think they held it against me that I didn't go. Um, uh, but I, I really, really have a huge amount of, uh, of respect for all of them that went, including my tios and tias. And, and um, it kind of gets it in historical sense because, um, I, I, especially uh, during the 40s and, and even into the 60s and 70s, uh, I, I've always felt, uh, and we know it historically, that uh, we're treated here in this country to this day as if... Um, we're invaders or we're not wanted. And I think, you know, uh, I totaled up the, 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 the figures in my family, if you will, and nine of my deals and deals served. Three of them were in combat. Eight of uh, my, my primos served. Four of them were in combat. And so you put those two generations, and it's about 17 of my family members served in the military, if not fought in the Vietnam or, or, or World War II. And I think that's a, uh, it's not necessarily out of the ordinary in terms, of, especially in World War II, because entire brothers served. Right. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a, I think it's just kind of one small testimony to the fact that my country, my, my family has served my country with its blood, you know. Uh, but yet, uh, my parents uh, couldn't apparently buy a house in Tower Park after my dad served in, in the World War II era. He wasn't a, a veteran of the war, but he was in Brazil. But he served. They, they called him, he put in his time. So um, I just, uh, my small contribution, if you will, to let people know that not only do we consider ourselves uh, the first Americans, but uh, actually maybe the second, if you think in indigenous terms, but. Um, uh, we were here before the Teatro of Guadalupe, um, or the Treaty of Guadalupe, and, and uh, uh, we've been here all along, but yet, even to this day, uh, we're, we're made to feel by some uh, as others, and yet, my primos uh, fought in Vietnam. Uh, uh, I've got at least one cousin that never was right ever since he came home. From He was a grunt. Um, he was never right. Uh, his brother, um, uh, came home, and I think, I don't remember exactly, but he passed away maybe when he was around 45, 50. Yeah. We think it was Agent Orange, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then their their father fought in Burma. So that's within that one nuclear family, three males fought in two different wars. Uh, yet, uh, especially their father was made to feel as if he wasn't uh, welcome in this country. So, uh, I, I I don't, on the one hand, we're a very ordinary family. On another hand, uh, we're a family that has certainly uh, done service to this country. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, when it comes to U.S. history, the, the contribution of Mexican-American servicemen ha is, is not, is a quieted story. I mean, my students are shocked when we talk about, well, they're the most decorated, they're the most, all of these yeah. things that, we know, um, those of us who study uh, Chicana, Chicano history, we, we know this, this history. Uh, you have experienced this history. Uh, and um, so I do think that it is important to remind folks uh, of the major sacrifice that uh, has been made, continues to be made by families. Um, and um, it must... It must have been very difficult, I would think, for for your father, who served in World War II. You're fighting against fascism. You're fighting against, you know, these imperialist powers, your yeah. communists, all this stuff, right? And then you're coming home and you're being treated as a second-class citizen. That's a very um, difficult situation, I would think, to to come home to. Like what? Like what do you mean? I can't buy a house, like, yeah. right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think you're warranted in, in your feelings. Uh, if I could, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of a kind of a context for it because, um, as you know, I, I was trained as a historian, and um, this is I, I don't advocate doing this. Do not prepare the night before your interview because you're dead tired the morning. <laughs> But I thought it would be really easy to, to, to uh, uh, 
to research some numbers, but it, it turns out it's not. And uh, I'll explain why in a second. In World War II, the best estimate that I've seen is 400,000 to, 400, to 500,000 uh, Latinos served yes. in, in World War II. But that's an undercount because uh, they lumped uh, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, which was, we were Latinos primarily were Mexican American in this country in those days. They lumped them in with Caucasian, so the numbers very, very blurred. But that was a figure that I think is very defensible and an underestimation. And then, out of those, 3.2% uh, uh, of them uh, uh, were Latino. Um, uh, let me get it straight. Um, 400, 500,000 uh, were Latinos served, uh, and 3.2 of it, they represented 3.2% of the entire military at, at that time. 3.2 doesn't sound a lot, a, a lot like a lot, but um, we have to remember, uh, you know, we live in, in the 2023s, and we're 50% plus of the population of California, but back then there were not as many Mexicans or Latinos in the entire country, and just my guess is maybe we were 5 to 7% back then. Mm -hmm. So 3.2 uh, is a, takes on more importance in, in that context. If you fast forward uh, to Vietnam, uh, uh, there were 170,000 Latinos uh, that served, but we represented 5.2% of the deaths in Vietnam. And again, 5.2 is not a huge number, but when you think of even the 70s, we were not that big of a, a percentage as, as represented throughout the country. So 5.2 is not a, a figure to sneer at that gave their lives up. Mm -hmm. for for this country. So um, that's kind of one of the reasons why I want to see this in a historical context. And, and if I could, as it turns out, I, I would just been on a kick. Uh, 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 Tom Hanks and, and uh, Steven Spielberg have put out this amazing trilogy of, 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 of movies about the, the wars, nice. right? So you have the Band of Brothers, uh, which is in uh, in Europe. You have the Pacific, which is in uh, the Pacific, uh, and then they have Saving Private Ryan, which is in Europe, and they're apparently going to come out with, an, with one about the Air Force real soon. And I have a lot of admiration for those uh, actors and, and directors, uh, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. But I also, I, I, if they were in front of me, with all due respect, I would say, shame on you. You made these beautiful uh, productions and you would have thought that the only people that fought in, in Vietnam or in, in World War II, which they cover on these movies, you would have thought the only people that fought uh, in those wars from our country were Caucasian. How could you ignore people of color? How could you ignore the contributions of, of, of the Latinos, the African Americans? Uh, I don't know the figures, but the African Americans died by far in greater proportion uh, to, to their population yes, and, <clears throat> because they were placed in the front lines. Yeah. So, oh, excuse me. So, and, and even enlightened people like that don't get it, you know. So, um, it's not even a question of, uh, of racism uh, from my perspective, uh, from my vantage point in the 2020s, but it's, it's omission. Uh, I'm sure they didn't intentionally want to admit people, but they did. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very uh, irritating. Uh, it's very, it's actually very sad. So, yeah. Um, it could and, be considered insulting. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and just one other story that comes to mind. I don't know if my dad was involved with this, but one of my deals, or it had to be a deal, was in Texas after the war. And of course, they went into the cantina to get a, a drink, and um, the bartender refused to serve the Mexicans in uniform. And the, the that situation only changed because there was another patron at the at the uh, bar, and, and he said, "You serve to that man. He served your country. The least you can do is serve him a drink." This is a, a, a an American in in uniform. The the bartender wanted to deny him a, a simple drink. Mm -hmm. So, uh, those those stories are just uh, very troubling. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about your dad's involvement in World War Two. Um, 
you mentioned he wasn't in combat. So why don't yeah. you why don't you yeah. tell us the yeah. story? Yeah. Well, the thing that, that had got me to talk to you about this whole thing, uh, I start with, um, and again, using Saving Private Ryan as kind of a, a template. Um, during World War II, uh, my three uncles were in combat. My uncle Dan was in Burma. My uncle Sal was in France. My uncle Rudy was in, in, in uh, the Pacific. My dad was a World War II era veteran, but he got stationed in Brazil. But I always think about, especially just because it's you know soft spot in your heart, I think of my poor grandmother being here in this country with three of her sons in combat. It must have been torture. Um, and then I found out through my cousins that not only was, uh, you know, she giving her sons uh, to, the, to the country, if you will, uh, she was a part of, and I don't, I have to research the name or who might have been involved, but she was involved with these Mexican women leagues uh, that supported the war effort. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly what she did. There's the name that comes to mind is Madres Mexicanas okay. de Guerra. Okay. And it was founded here in the 1940s. Sacramento had a very vibrant chapter. Yeah. Okay. And it was featured in that documentary. Valentia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Valentia. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so you have that. And then two of my uncles, their spouses were wax. Uh, initially enough, I've always heard the term wax. I never, under, I never knew what it meant, but what I've learned since three o'clock last night, uh, <laughs> that it's the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And both my Aunt Lorraine and my Aunt Jimmy uh, were wax. And uh, there's, uh, and they were in uniform. So, uh, and then I, I really came to understand more what wax did. Uh, they, they served in hospitals, they served, they served in administrative capacities. Uh, and they served in the factories when the men could staff the factories so that they helped uh, make the munitions. So I don't know exactly what my aunts did, but they were, they were wax. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, getting to my father, uh, it's almost, I, I, I've been searching for the right words for, for years, but it's, I, I guess the best I can say is kind of a cruel irony because he answered the call. Uh, he didn't protest. He didn't try to get away from it. But his, his assignment was in Brazil. Uh, and then the irony, the cruel irony being that my three uncles were fighting at the same time in different theaters. Um, and uh, again, uh, my dad was part of that silent generation, so he didn't talk a lot about a lot of things in his, his, his early life. But I Did know, you tell us what part of the military? He was Army. Army. I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry let me back up. He was Navy. Navy. Yeah. Um, and his, uh, his assignment in Brazil, uh, he was the guy that waved in the airplanes when they came in. I don't, I don't know what the, the title of that job is. Um, but he did tell me one story where um, he felt guilty uh, not fighting, which I suspect a lot of young men did in those years. So he wrote one of his brothers and he said, I think I need to volunteer to go. And his brother wrote him back and said, don't you dare. Don't you dare stay put. Don't make my, my mother go through another one. So uh, mm -hmm. he, he wound up staying in Brazil. Um, and relatively speaking, it was, it was easy service. Um, he, uh, he just didn't have to deal with any combat. Uh, yeah. And um, the other story that's kind of humorous, if you, know, if you knew my dad, but uh, he hated the ocean. He hated water. Lord knows why he, he uh, joined the Navy. <laughs> and apparently the, in the Navy, when you cross the equator, at least in the old days, you had to jump ship into the ocean. <laughs> so, so he had to go through that ritual, uh, uh, which I suspect uh, gave him nightmares for many years after. But that's a lot different than fighting. Um, yeah. And, and uh, to just give a little bit more uh, resonance to what my uncles did, my uncle Rudy uh, was in, in ships being bombarded in the Pacific. My uncle Sal was fighting tree to tree in France. 
and I don't know exactly what my uncle Dan did, but he, and who knows historically what the role of Burma was in those years, though I know we, we were stationed all over the world, but my uncle Dan fought in, in, uh, in uh, Burma. Yeah. You, you also mentioned earlier how you had a wonderful childhood that your parents, you know, showed you love and, and all that. And um, do you think part of that would be because he didn't? He wasn't in combat, and he yeah. wasn't hardened yeah. oh, in yeah, that no. way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I know my cousin Richard spoke about his dad. Uh, the war totally. I remember my uncle Rudy when I was young, and he was hard to be around, very hard. And you, it, he entered the navy when he was sixteen. So who knows what he saw. Um, uh, and and one uh, one part of Valentia which really really touched me was uh, he, his, he spoke to his dad after the war and my grandfather hugged him and congratulated him and thanked him for serving. Um, so Mount Garudi. Um, what about that story makes you so emotional, do you think? Is it that that these men of that era embraced, said a few words? I think. Well, uh, for me, it's the immigrant, the unwanted immigrant, thanking his son for being a good American. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, my Uncle Sal, um, they say he got gray hair. From fighting, yeah, and stressful, and was one of the biggest pacifists you ever saw. Mm -hmm. He he wouldn't hurt a fly. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, do you need a moment? Let me get some Kleenex. I got some. I got some. Okay, yeah. yeah. Take your time. It's hard. Sorry. Sometimes drinking water. I mean, ayuda a calmar. Do you want some water? Or? Uh, no, I got this right here. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get it together here. Yeah. Um, let me know when you want to go. Yeah. You were saying about your Uncle Sal. He was a, one of the biggest pacifists. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he had been in combat in the forests of France. Uh, and, and actually, uh, um, a band of brothers, I think, shows that kind of fighting literally in France, if that's the one, that's the episode that I remember correctly. And then my cousins, you know, I grew up with them. Um, like, uh, we think my cousin Danny died from Agent Horn. And my cousin David, he was, uh, when we were kids, he was, loud, gre gregarious, mischievous, and when he came back, he was kind of a shell, and, and I don't want to speak for him. I hope I can get David uh, to join you in these conversations, because I know he has a lot to say, but mm -hmm. to date, I don't think any of us have been able to talk to him about it, but uh, purely my perception, but you see him today, and he's just kind of a shell of who he was. Uh, it's not the same David I knew before Vietnam. Yeah. And he was a grunt. He was a grunt. He was in the middle of it uh, in Vietnam. So, So yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't think our family is bitter by any stretch. It's just, it's touching, you know. It's just touching. Of course, of course. If, if I may, I, I, I wanted to ask you about... You know, you have all these men serving, right? right? And war, I mean, the ultimate sacrifice is how you show your masculinity. Like, I, I, I'm I, curious to know if that was part of the culture of your family, that it was tied into, like, becoming a man. This is what you do, you know, yeah. or... Uh, I know you, you said that you fought a, uh, against that and that you had political reasons for 
not wanting to serve in, in Vietnam, but um, there has to be some sort of influence, I would think, when you have so many members yes. of your family. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a very good question uh, or insight. Um, I was only three when my grandmother died, my grandma uh, Beatriz Inez. I was only six when my grandfather died, so I only have very faint memories, very, very faint memories of both of them. But what my primos have told me, and my dad, um, uh, especially me, my grandfather, uh, he was a very pacifistic kind of personality. I don't, I don't know what he really went through in the Cristero movement or the war. I don't know what he thought politically, but he was apparently a very, very uh, uh, gentle man, I guess is the way I would put it. My grandmother, uh, she was more, I, I gather, of, of a firebrand. Um, but, you know, what little I could get from my dad about my grandmother, he would just say she was a saint. So I think the Inigas family is kind of a pacifistic family just by temperament. You know, we're not aggressive, uh, and, and we certainly, I don't think most of us got caught up in the Jan John Wayne mentality of, 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 of what war was like. Uh, my. My, my primos, I think that's one of the reasons why we all get along so well, is that we, we, uh, we're very tolerant um, and we understand we're, we're all crazy and we're all different, but we, we're very tolerant. And I think that starts with my, my grandfather Gregorio and my grandma Beatriz. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, you don't think it, um, masculinity to become an hombre, to become a man, was tied he, well again um no i don't okay just in, in in our nature generally speaking okay not to say we were all angels but generally speaking yeah but my father was a very gentle man yeah um uh, and i never I rare, rarely did he raise his voice um uh, and i never had to worry about getting beaten you know which yeah. is common very common in some families yeah and um uh, I, I never had to worry about, you know, my dad's going to take a whack at my mom. Never. It, mm. we, we were, it was just, we were, by example, we were raised to never lay a, a, a hand on a woman. Um, my dad, uh, in his younger days, uh, and, and I, he, well, sort of ashamed to admit, I was kind of like he was in my younger days, kind of a raconteur <laughs> in the best sense of the word. Not a, he wasn't a troublemaker, but he enjoyed having fun. But... Uh, when he was, I think, in his early 40s, uh, he stopped drinking. So we didn't have the bottle in our house, uh, you know, threatening us all the time. Um, very disciplined man. Uh, when the doctor said, you really need to stop drinking, he did. Um, and uh, I'm sure that contributed to the peace in the house, you know. Yeah. But, even, but even when I was a kid and they would have these great parties, there was drinking, but it wasn't, you know, that violent kind of thing that sometimes can happen within families. Yeah. I'm sure the laws weren't as strict as they are now, where no. you, you can't really even no. spank your no. kid. Or, and uh, and yeah. just uh, as an aside, uh, my parents partied Mexican style, you know. They would, they would invite the families and the friends, and they would have the, the little, when the, uh, the, the, uh, the cradles for the kids or whatever. They just put them aside. The kids were there, the parents would be drinking and eating. But it was all very, very uh, low key. It wasn't crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of women um, in your family in terms of supporting whether it's the sons or the husbands like did you yeah. uh, you mentioned a few of them were part of WAC did, yeah. did you see or do you remember like, witnessing any of that and yeah um uh, I think it's it's safe to say that I have uh, I think four tias on my dad's side, and uh, one of them was a what we would call a little broncuda. She was kind of the outlier, but um, I don't think any of my uh, my mother included or my tias saw themselves necessarily as feminists, uh, though maybe my Aunt Masako might have, her son and daughter could speak to that. But uh, 
they were, I mean, they were wonderful tias. They were just wonderful. It was kind of, a, I don't want to overstress it, but it was kind of communal. If you went to my Aunt Pat's house, she took care of you. If you went to my Aunt Lorraine's house, they took care of you. And there was a lot of intermixing of, 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 of the nuclear families. Uh, and, and they weren't political in, in the sense that we think of it today, though my Aunt Masawa had very strong feelings, but she wasn't necessarily a very overt political person, just very strong in her beliefs. Um, in terms of the support, uh, yes, my mom gave up everything uh, uh, to come to be uh, uh, with a, a poor husband. Um, but there's a little story to that. She kind of was tired of the craziness in Mexico City, you know, and, and uh, kind of the, what I'd call the aristocratic drama, you know. She just wanted to get away from it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think overtly feminist, uh, but each one of them strong in their own way. Uh, my Aunt Lorraine was in no stretch a, a political person, but she was strong. Uh, my Aunt Pat, I think, was more traditional in her temperament and outlook, but uh, uh, after having raised uh, four kids, uh, she went back to school, got her degrees, uh, became a, uh, a teacher in, in preschool. Uh, not strident, but she did catch some of that feminist uh, fever, for lack of a better way of putting it, but she wasn't strident about it. So in their own way, uh, my tias were, were uh, they were kind of self-directed, but not in a political sense, I think, not, mm -hmm. not too much. Um, my primas, uh, very modest, uh, most of them just normal lives. Um, in, in, in that sense, kind of like their mothers, you know, not trying to yeah. necessarily change the world. Uh, and I have to, to speak to my mother. Uh, she came to, to, to live and be a, a part of my dad's life. She was not very uh, at all supportive of Chicanismo, uh, the feminist movement, but in her own right, she was a, a, an incredible in, uh, a feminist role model in the sense mm -hmm. that uh, she never shied away from working. She loved to work. Uh, she was good at what she did. And then in her late 30s, she, she seized an opportunity to, to start a business. She started the business. She was one of the pioneers here in Sacramento, uh, one of the first three interpreters, uh, Spanish-English interpreters and mm -hmm. translators. Um, and so she, as she would put it, she didn't wave the flag, but she did a, a very feminist act. Uh, uh, she brought home the bacon or helped bring it home, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but never thought of it or spoke about it in feminist terms. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense in terms of um, the opportunities for women when they're raised here that they can get jobs and they establish some sort of independence. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, she was a huge role model uh, for my daughters, especially my older daughter. They're very uh, similar in temperament. And she was a huge role model for my wife. And uh, mm. uh, very t because my w wife uh, came from a more traditional East LA background. And the father was the star, you know, and, and, and my, my, my mother-in-law was the one that took care of the seven kids. Uh, she kept that family together, both her siblings and the, uh, this, this, the ones to follow. Um, and I, I, you know, you're wrapped up in your own life and your own worldview so many times. And then uh, my wife has won a couple of awards as uh, her business as a Chicana or a Latina business woman of the year, whatever. And she's so funny because college educated, uh, you will sit down to her and she doesn't take second string to anybody. She's, uh, she speaks her mind. And then before she's supposed to receive the award, she's freaking out because she doesn't know what to say. Right? And I said, man, you get up all the time and you speak in front of people and you, and you don't have any problem putting people in their places, their place, and you can't say a few words about yourself. <laughs> she goes, oh, I just don't like to do that. humble, yeah. yeah. So I helped her write, and, and so she gave me some thoughts, and I helped her organize it. But one of the things that was very touching to me is she uh, she referenced my mom as being the role model for her to start her own business. And the entire time that my mom was alive and they knew each other, they, they, they got along very well, but 
that was the first time I realized how important my mom was in a professional sense in, in, in my wife Victoria's life. Um, and, and my mom was, the, she was the perfect blend of Mexicana and modern American woman in the sense that uh, the food had to be on, on the table for breakfast for my dad because he was traditional. <laughs> and then she would rush off to work, take care of business at work, come back home. Wow. Yeah, uh, but she did it uh, mm -hmm. in a loving way, and yeah. it wasn't, you know. Yeah, boy, like she probably enjoyed, enjoyed that feeding him. That was kind him. of the way she saw herself. her love language. Yes, yes <laughs> as we yeah, say it yeah. nowadays. So it was, um, it was, um, <laughs> it was interesting to see her negotiate kind of the family life and in the professional world. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I just wanted to see um, if there was anything you'd like to add in terms of your father's service or your tios or your tias and primos who who served. Um, I, I think one way um, I would like to hear you put it is what message do you think for the younger generations, right? Um, who see themselves yeah. still sort of struggling with identity, with yeah. racism, with everything that comes their way. Yeah, I think, I think one message is, um, and my wife uh, has been very good at this, because uh, you know we wake, we raised our kids in the, the suburbs. Uh, uh, they didn't grow up in the barrio. Um, they lived, you know, a traditional American life, if you would. Um, but my wife, more probably more so than me, was always behind them. And I'm sure you heard this, or probably say it to your kids, don't forget where you come from. Don't forget who your people are. And so that would be my message to anyone who's younger than hears my voice or wants to talk to me. Just don't forget, don't forget. And if you don't know about it, find out, right? Because I just had a beautiful moment with my older daughter last week. I went to do grandpa babysitting duties down in Southern California. And she's a, oh, she's a tremendous professional. She's just incredible. She got her master's in public administration at, at, at USC. And it's really high up in this organization, uh, just a go-getter, worked in politics. And my wife and I just kind of kid is that, you know, sometimes I don't think Veronica uh, understands where especially Vicky came from, what my wife had to go through, or what my, my family had to go through. Uh, and then I was with my daughter last week, and she goes, Dad, you know, I listen to everything you say. Mm. I listen to, and I watch everything you do, mm. and I know what you and, and, and Mom went through. And she said, uh, I, I will not forget where I came from, right? So even though she's a totally Americanized, woman in this country, we've somehow been able to let her retain that sense of, uh, of uh, background. Um, and um, she doesn't have to speak Spanish or be a, a Chicana in the traditional sense of the word, um, but she hasn't forgotten her roots. And, and, and for me, the beautiful thing about it is she's very humble. She's tough. She's a strong worker. She will put you in your place if, if you need it, but she's she's got a heart, you know, mm -hmm. and she's not presumida, as, as you say, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why do you think it's, a, why would you, um, how would you tell young people that, why it's important for them to never forget where they come from? Like, why, is, why does that matter? Like, Well, I just have to say, and my younger daughter, we didn't have this conversation, but I'm equally impressed by her. She's a lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just gutted through law school and she did everything we asked for, so I'm very proud of my, my daughters. Um, uh, for me, why it's important is because if you don't have humility, both in your personal life and in your work life, it leads to really, really uh, blatant uh, mistakes that impact other human beings. Um, if you don't have a, a sense of compassion for the coworker that's struggling or that has two kids at home and is pregnant and needs to take some time off at eight o'clock in the morning. If you don't have that kind of humility and compassion, 
you're going to make decisions that are going to be spiteful and, and at, the, at the very le least unintentionally mean. So um, I, I think, um, I think our, our, our culture, what we have in us, we have a lot of faults. But we have a sense of compassion and grace. And, and uh, even though my kids are modern American uh, young women, they still have that, what, the gracia from our culture. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a tool to, to survive better. Um, Definitely makes us better human beings yeah, <laughs> to yeah, be around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, like I say, uh, you know, I, get, I get choked up thinking about my, my grandparents and my uncles and aunts, but man, they were so humble, you know, they were so humble. There was never any pressing me on them, not a ton. And, and uh, you know, and if ever, you know, I start floating the crowd with my, my ego, my parents would be, <laughs> come down, come back down. So, uh, and I have to say, I not only suggest that people live like that, it just makes living better. It just makes living so much more rich, you know, I don't, it's just nice. It's nice not to have that agenda of conquer and, and divide and be mean. It's just it's a horrible way to live. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, as you know, you've got to be competitive in this culture. You know, so you got to hold your ground. But there's ways to do it the right way and the ways to do it in, in a very mean spirited way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That concludes mm -hmm. our. If I could, I, yes. just, I want to say something for the record. Um, As you know, I, I'm very, very, very taken by you as uh, not only a person, but as a professor in, a, in your profession. And uh, I was telling my wife this last night. Um, I look at you as Doctora Marquez, Professor UC Davis, and I see um, the embodiment of uh, many dreams that I had. And it's, it's so nice to see that in this day and age, a young Chicano, Chicana, can have the dream of getting those degrees and the, the means are now there because the system has made it possible, grudgingly. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, uh, it's happening. So I can sit back and say, well, I fell short here or I fell short there. The Dr. Marquez, she did it. And I'm very proud of that. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, okay, that concludes at 2.58 p.m. Thank you.